Would you like to start? Um, maybe with Jane, the girlfriend, like what, whatever caused her to feel like she needed to hoard things or like keep things without <laughs> sharing them. <laughs> so what, what's your take on that? Anyway. It feels almost like an anxiety, like she's afraid that if she gives um, it to others, like she won't have enough for herself, even if that's unreasonable, like it's hard to dissuade her from that anxiety. However, obviously, she doesn't feel that anxiety like empathetically for other people. No. So, no. <laughs> it's a little... So wh what is uh, the definition for obsessive compulsive disorder? Obsessions are compulsions. That easy, right? Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Of course, it has to be clinically significant, but then again, that's implied because every mental disorder must be clinically significant with a couple of exceptions. Um, so, do we see any compulsive behaviors? Right? No. So, and, and what, what role, if, if she did demonstrate compulsive behaviors, what role would they serve, generally speaking? To alleviate the like, negative feelings created by her obsession. Right. So, again, so. There are these intrusive thoughts or obsessions uh, that result in anxiety, and the compulsive behavior is some ritualistic act to alleviate that anxiety. It, it almost, um, in a way, deflects or distracts uh, so as to alleviate anxiety. So that's, that's the goal of, of any, in this case, defense mechanism, because there is a, proposed to be a defense, an ego defense mechanism that underlies the compulsion. Shelf exam. What is that defense mechanism? Oh, it's like ego dystonic. Well, the specific name. Yeah. You're right. I think it is. <laughs> so the answer was ego dystonic, and it is. Ego dystonic, ego syntonic describes um, the almost like the uh, adaptivity of the defense. But what defense are we talking about? It's called undoing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called undoing. So it's that ritualistic act that undoes. You know, I know you're not supposed to use the word in its own definition, but reverses. Um, in this case, then uh, reducing the anxiety, undoing. We don't see that here, though, right? Uh, but that doesn't matter, because if she has intrusive thoughts, then she still goes in for obsessive compulsive disorder. What role does hoarding disorder play in the OCD spectrum? Well, knowing what hoarding disorder is, or like imparting value on something that's essentially valueless, usually trash, and so you can hold on to it even to your own detriment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yep. Yeah, so, um, and that's the exact definition of hoarding, and therefore hoarding disorder. That in, uh, individuals have significant difficulty parting with uh, objects or possessions that don't hold any real um, nostalgic value or um, monetary value. Nonetheless, they're, they're hoarded. They're, uh, they're not disposed of. Um, there are a couple of variants of hoarding disorder. I don't think this will come up on a shelf exam, but it's certainly a, a pearl. Uh, one is when the individual has difficulty parting with, and then, and then the other is that there is excessive accumulation of. And of course, you could have um, both. Um, given hoarding disorder and giving obsessive compulsive disorder and the definitions we just described, how do, they, how do they relate? Unlikely to come up in your shelf exam, but probably good to know anyway, if that's such a thing. Originally, hoarding was part of the definition of OCD, uh, but the American Psychiatric Association back in 2013 decided to pull it out of the definition and create its own freestanding diagnosis, albeit within the obsessive, compulsive, and related disorder chapter. So it is a disorder that is hoarding disorder that is closely related to uh, OCD. Anybody know the other disorders related to obsessive compulsive disorder? I think the associations of like ADHD and like a differential could be OCPD, which can look like OCD. Right, so there, there, uh, there is a comorbidity uh, between uh, ADHD and even Tourette's. Uh, and um, OCD. Um, but in the chapter itself, what's, what's another disorder that we probably alluded to yesterday, of all things? Yeah, body dysmorphic disorder. Right. 
Uh, body dysmorphic disorder, I think, is one of only three conditions in the DSM that is defined through a maladaptive or clinically significant preoccupation. Um, what is the preoccupation that causes clinically significant distress or impairment defining body dysmorphic disorder? Like things are wrong with your body that don't actually exist, but you perceive as there. Right. It's the imagined defect in appearance. Right. Um, tricky question. Um, Oh, by, by the way, instant honors. Not really. Instant honors if you, if you answer correctly. Did anybody actually watch American Mary last night after yesterday's discussion? No. Uh, you, guys, you guys were just almost, almost dismissed from class today with an honors. But <laughs> missed opportunity. Um, uh, for, um, I'm trying to think, what are the, um, what's the other preoccupation syndrome defined? Um, in the DSM, there's two more. Illness anxiety. Yeah, illness anxiety is the other. And unlike having an imagined defect in appearance, what is the focus of illness anxiety disorder? Fear of developing or having an illness. Yeah, right. Having or acquiring um, a severe illness. Right. Anybody know what the other preoccupation syndrome is? Trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is considered. Uh, I don't know if the key word is used to define trichotillomania. By the way, trichotillomania, though, answers my previous question, that, oh. yet, that is yet another OCD-related OCD disorder. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Thank you for reminding me. Now, the other preoccupation syndrome um, would be eating disorders, where the preoccupation is with uh, uh, self-image or body image. Okay. Um, all right, um, any other thoughts on Jerry's girlfriend? What's, why do you say that? I feel like the hoarding, I mean, I can see how she was like stockpiling things because she was worried about not having enough, but also it seemed like she just wasn't thinking about her people at all. She just didn't care about the needs of others. And she was lying um, about the sex thing. So I don't know, she just seems to not really, she might have antisocial personalities. <laughs> so we, we could at least say she appears to lack empathy. Uh, and um, what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Because sometimes those clinical terms are interchanged and they shouldn't be. I think empathy is when you can relate to someone because you yourself haven't personally like gone through something similar versus sympathizing is like you try to feel for someone but you yourself can't understand that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, largely because of experience, and perhaps not, um, individuals who are empathetic actually have a capacity to view a situation through someone else's perspective. Right, um, and the opposite of that, the alternative to that would be egocentrism, where an individual has the incapacity to view a situation through anyone's perspective but their own. Right, uh, so that that's empathy, and it, it is it is different um, and differentiated from sympathy. Um, this character is not empathetic; uh, she doesn't have the capacity. Now that puts individuals at risk. Uh, um, first and foremost, uh, they could be at risk for nothing at all. And it could just be a, a, a very concrete and uh, unempathetic person, period. Uh, but then again, there might be a risk uh, for developing uh, what usually will be, that is, if you look at a hierarchy or differential, a cluster B personality disorder. Um, the the um, antisocial personality, the borderline personality, narcissistic, and histrionic uh, have a very difficult time uh, viewing a situation from anyone else's perspective but their own. Does she show any other behaviors? Does she say anything that might allow us to say it's more um, towards one of those conditions than the others in the cluster bit? I'm going to take that pause as a no. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily pick up on anything either. So let's, let's go through them. Uh, if now Larry David called us and asked for you to help edit the script, what would you have included what would you have included in this script to allow for her diagnosis to be supported by or to support the diagnosis of histrionic personality disorder More like explicit attention behavior. Right. right so her driving need to be the center of attention uh, I, I didn't get that here, and I'm not sure if Larry David would carry to write that in the script, but nonetheless, he's going to hypothetically call us anyway. Antisocial personality disorder. 
maybe like a lack of regard for rules or um, like general laws? Absolutely. Narcissistic personality. Like, Put your hand. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> expecting like favorable treatment, but also like trying to like manipulate people to like do things for you, for you specifically. Right, favorable treatment, believing they're special. And they believe they can only be understood by people as special as they are. Okay. And then finally, um, which one are you missing? Borderline well, personality. Um, that's like the splitting personality. One day they um, like something, the next day they're talking bad about them. Mm -hmm. Right, so idealization, devaluation, splitting. Right. So that, that certainly, if written to the script, would support borderline personality. All right. Any other thoughts about this character? What are the characters you want to discuss this morning? The Mimbo? Tony. The Himbo, yeah. I was shocked. I thought he had narcissistic personality. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, it's funny because uh, obviously um, Jerry and Elaine are two core characters in this and by the way they've had a prior relationship so they really are a dyad albeit exes right um, and then their mutual others um, certainly provide discussion uh, provide behaviors that lend to discussion of personality specifically cluster B personality disorder so what did you see in Tony that you didn't see in Jerry's girlfriend that has you believing that he has Narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder? Well, uh, I keep forgetting the, the shorter. George. George. George? Yeah, like he, the way, like when they're at like lunch together and then he's like basically, George is like suggesting things and he's just like completely shutting down, like, no, we're going to do this, like, like kind of like, oh, we're going to do this because like, we're adrenaline seekers and then like also like about the sandwiches. He's like suggesting the average He's like, no, we have to have like two minute sandwiches and it's like, you. I feel like he like subconsciously was like basically manipulating using George to uh, like cater to him mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, adrenaline seekers. What's that about? Because that that what you just identified might lend to clinically significant distress or impairment in some individuals. Um, and and of course Tony would blame George here, but th there was an accident. So let's say there's recurrent behavior with repeated accidents to a point where Tony seeks help from you. Um, and, this, and here's a little bit of a hint. In that psychotherapy session, what's something you might want to address when it comes to identifying that he is an adren adrenaline seeker? What defense mechanism? Acting out. Uh, acting out, it's potential. This is a difficult one. Sublimation. Sublimation could be. How about if I gave you the history that as a child, he actually fell from a significant height and developed a fear of heights? Like a reaction formation? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, Bechanel <clears throat> refers to this as, as counterphobic attitude. Um, the observation that some individuals with a phobia uh, which is guided by avoidance behavior, avoidance being the defense mechanism, tend to run toward their fear. And when we see high-risk behaviors like this that, is, that are outside of the con a context of a larger disorder, of course, if he had established bipolar, different discussion. But uh, when it's not in that context, uh, especially during a psych psychotherapy session, one of the things we could consider is that the natural uh, interplay of defenses uh, is such that the individual's behavior is the complete opposite of what we would expect. Individu individuals who actually run towards their fear. So here, avoidance as a defense is overcome by reaction formation. Uh, and that lends to behavior where people uh, will rock climb, extreme sports, etc., despite the fact that subconsciously they actually fear it. Not in play for every single person that engages in such events, but if, again, the way this was um, proposed, uh, if causing clinically significant distress or impairment and you have to render a medical opinion, it would be something you needed to consider, especially during psychotherapy. Right? So we have another defense mechanism, reaction information, which is what? 
of doing the opposite. It's like coping with one feeling by like doing the opposite. Okay. And movie? July 4th movie. That, uh, I, would, I would suggest that there's got to be some one person in this room who cannot go an, an Independence Day without watching this movie. Independence Day? I don't know. I always have to watch Independence Day. No, well, no. Uh, <laughs> we can't, you can't go through any July 4th holiday uh, without seeing this film. My parents are uh, immigrants, sorry. What's that? My parents are immigrants, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, uh, I'm not going to hold you accountable. Everybody else is on the hook now. <laughs> now, Jaws? Um, okay. I've seen it, but not yeah. like religiously. You mean the one with the boat sharks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, immigrant parents, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that excuse applies here, but. <laughs> no, you're good. No, you're good. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, one of my, uh, it, it's one movie that I tend to lecture on often, uh, and I will often use the opening line, title slide, that this film has nothing to do with the shark. Right. So, um, you're lucky that uh, this clerkship is not the first clerkship of the year. Otherwise, we know what, we know what will be assigned right now. So you're safe. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, what are the characters you want to talk about here? George. Always George. I think everybody's ever a baby. Always George. What do you got? Well, I noticed like pretty strong identification when he was like talking to um, Tony, I think was his name. Like he like flipped his hat backwards like Tony did. <laughs> yeah. I, and that, you know, and, and we didn't talk before this, uh, mm -hmm. but you, you used a clinical term here, identification, which I think is 110% accurate. Um, because would anybody here feel uncomfortable saying that George in this episode regresses? Would anybody? Um, he says he regresses. He actually uses the R word, yeah. all right? Um, and it like, it, it's likely that he regresses back to an adolescent age, right? Um, I, I think Jerry even says, what are you in the eighth grade? Yeah. All right? Um, the eighth grade is actually a psychosocial stage where Eric Erickson posited that we go through this um, crisis, right, um, of identity versus role confusion. So, yeah, I think he's struggling with, with his identity, and Eric Erickson would actually agree with you. Uh, he is behaving like an adolescent. Jerry calls him out as being in the eighth grade or behaving as if he is in the eighth grade, and that is the age range in which Eric Erickson says that we struggle with issues pertaining to identity, and if we do not successfully resolve that conflict, there will be role confusion. And that's exactly what's going on with George Costanza in this episode. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to, to name me all eight, uh, but within Eric Erickson's theory, if we think that George regresses back to identity versus role confusion, what stages had he then uh, progressed through? Can you name the first few stages of that stage theory up to adolescence? What's the first stage that corresponds to the Freudian oral stage? About one year of age? Basic trust versus mistrust? No? no? Okay. <laughs> Taking you back. <laughs> More than double your age. <laughs> the second stage that links to the Freudian anal stage um, would be uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. Okay. Uh, and then after that, is um, uh, it, uh, industry is fourth. I think it's uh, initiative. Oh, okay. Give it up. Yeah. And then industry. Okay. Uh, then adolescence. Right. So th those would be the four stages um, that George would have progressed through. And by the way, I'm not sure he's. I can't say that he's not fixated at any of those stages too. Uh, but all right. Um, other characters here. By the way, um, we skipped over something with Tony because towards the, well, certainly the second half of this, uh, of this episode, um, he's reacting to a medication, right? The way he behaves is just different from the way he behaves in the beginning, right? Why? What medications do we think he's, he's taking? 
status post of radical facial surgery or reconstructive surgery. Painless? Yeah. So what, what, what uh, gives us an opportunity to discuss the signs and symptoms of opioid intoxication? What do you got? Constricted people. Mm -hmm. Respiratory depression. Mm -hmm. okay. Slower speech. Right. So w with those signs and symptoms, we should know that the constricted or the pinpoint pupils are a necessary sign. And then there are related signs that we have to look for as well that we named, right? However, there is a better than 50-50 chance that on your shelf exam, the individual is going to present with dilated pupils and still have the single best answer of opioid intoxication or, or opioid overdose. Why? Taking other medications are counteractive. That could be. Uh, but let's say, uh, let's say no. Let's say in this, in this situation, you have a line in your clinical vignette that there were no, uh, there were no other um, medications taken. Maybe they're in withdrawal? Uh, they're not in withdrawal. This is, a, this is a presentation and opioid intoxication is your single best answer. There's one opioid that causes that. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. <laughs> a, I forgot what it was. Is it It's preparing, good, right? Uh, and again, the likelihood, if you list all the opioids, meperidine is one of X, right? Um, but you're, you're not going to get that, that likelihood. You're going to get a better than 50-50 chance because it's the outlier. So that's what we're going to ask you on the board, and that's, uh, that's what you're going to have to remember, right? So meperidine intoxication, meperidine overdose presents with dilated, okay, not pinpoint pupils. Uh, and you have to pick that up and... Um, as your single best answer, uh, make sure that you select opioid, opioid intoxication. Opioid withdrawal, uh, uh, how does this look? Let's see, there's a sequel to this episode. A lot of pain. Pain, mm -hmm. arthralgias, yeah. Agitation, diaphoresis. Anxiety. Nausea. Nausea, diaphoresis. Yawning. What does it look like? The flu. Uh, oh. Any flu patient on a shelf exam in psychiatry is opioid withdrawal. Right? So the acronym is TGI Fridays. It's pulled right from the DSM, obviously just a tad rearranged. The T stands for three. Um, the board usually does not require you to know the threshold, but uh, without that, it would be GI Fridays, which doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then Fridays is fever, um, rhinorrhea, insomnia, uh, dysphoria, arthralgias, yawning, and sympathetic hyperactivity, right? Including tremor, um, increased BP pulse, uh, piloerection, um, that's the S, so TGI, TGI Fridays. Anything else with Tony before we leave him again? All right, we're uh, almost to the bottom of the hour. Any other observations in last night's episode this stall? Yeah, yeah. Um, did, did you say grief? Potentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I yeah. <laughs> you, you, probably, you probably could review Kubler Ross's different stages that she has to go through. Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, and this is a great clinical pearl to kind of end the discussion with. Um, historically, when Kubler Ross um, proposes these different stages, people progress through upon the death of a loved one. She later revised her theory to apply to any form of loss, and that would apply here. So he survived the accident, but that doesn't mean that Elaine still couldn't progress through those stages, right? The other revision she made is that she identified, she recognized that people not necessarily uh, go through these stages linearly. They could certainly, for lack of a better word, relapse um, and go through a stage that they previously had. They could also skip stages. Um, And then one other final thought before we sign off. Um, Jerry, Jerry makes a comment pertaining to Tony uh, about um, Zippy the Pinhead. And the, the reason why I even chose this episode is because Jerry just so happens to name a character, although Zippy the Pinhead is its own character. Uh, the name is shared. The namesake is with the, the villain in Hellraiser, which we'll 
conclude this discussion, but certainly link to our discussion at noon uh, on uh, Clive Barker's Hellraiser, which is the film today for the 31 nights of Halloween. So we'll leave it there. Uh, and we'll reconnect back to um, our interns in a couple of minutes uh, to discuss more. Right. We're good. Thank you. Thank you.